In today's webinar, I will present an analysis of greenhouse gas emission forecasts for electrification of space heating in residential homes in the United States. First, I'd like to acknowledge the project team, which includes R&D engineer Subhajit Chakraborty, programmer Mitchell Dichter, R&D engineer Nelson Dichter, and student researcher Aref Abode. I also want to recognize our sponsor, the Natural Resources Defense Council. I would like to thank Peter Gagnon from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory for his assistance in using the cadmium data set for analysis, which I will discuss further. Our study objective was to estimate and compare the 15 year life cycle operational greenhouse gas emission impacts for both a natural gas furnace and a variable speed heat pump in a single family home simulated in locations across the United States. A gas furnace burns natural gas, which is approximately 95% methane for heating. The heat pump uses electricity to power a compressor-based refrigeration cycle to provide heating, essentially operating an air conditioner cycle in reverse. We forecast emissions for each heating system installed from 2022 to 2036 and operated for 15 years. Note that we only considered greenhouse gas emissions associated with operation of the heating system and not the embodied emissions associated with manufacturing the system. In order to complete this analysis, we have to account for emissions from a number of sources we're analyzing. In this case, the three different metrics we're comparing are carbon dioxide emissions, global warming potential on a 20 year time scale, and global warming potential on a 100 year time scale. Global warming potential is a metric used to compare the heating impact of gases in the atmosphere to an equivalent mass of carbon dioxide over the specified time frame. This gives us a way to be able to compare the impact of the release of various gases into the atmosphere. The heat pump has carbon dioxide emissions associated with electricity used to power the air handler fan, the compressor, and the electric resistance strip heat, which is a backup heat source used when in, enough heat cannot be supplied by the heat pump compressor alone. The heat pump also has refrigerant emissions from refrigerant leaks. Finally, a fraction of the electricity used for the heat pump is generated by natural gas power plants. Methane leaks associated with natural gas production for power generation are also analyzed. By comparison, the gas furnace has carbon dioxide emissions associated with the electricity used to power the air handler fan. The furnace is directly creating carbon dioxide when fuel is burned at the furnace for combustion. And finally, there are methane leaks associated with natural gas production, as well as methane leaks downstream in the meter inside the home itself. Note that we did not include leaks from transmission and local distribution of natural gas because these infrastructure leaks are not expected to scale with consumption um, unless portions of the transmission and distribution infrastructure are removed or not constructed in, um, in neighborhoods that are uh, electric service only. So um, I'm gonna walk you through each step of our analysis and our assumptions and then present the results. If you are aware of other data sources that we should consider, I definitely appreciate hearing from you. My email address is on the first slide of the presentation. So when we're comparing other gases relative to carbon dioxide, we need to apply a value for the global warming potential relative to carbon dioxide. By definition, the global warming potential or GWP of carbon dioxide over any time scale is one. Listed here are the values for the 20 and 100 year GWP for both refrigerant and methane. These values come from the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In the analysis, we, use the, we assume that refrigerant 410A is used in heat pumps today and that a lower GWP refrigerant such as R32 will be deployed for heat pumps starting in 2026. In terms of locations, we ran the simulation for the largest city in each combination of 48 states and seven DOE climate zones. 
This resulted in a combination of 97 cities. Because California was underrepresented relative to its population, because it's largely in one DOE climate zone, we also added San Jose and Sacramento to our simulation for increased resolution of results in California. We use TMY3 weather data obtained from white box technologies. In order to summarize the results, we compute population weighted average results for six regions shown here in the figure. Uh, so the Pacific, Rocky Mountains, Southwest, Midwest, Northeast, and Southeast. Um, in order to calculate the population weighted averages, we use 2018 census data for county population size for each county that contains the selected city. Okay, so in order to conduct this analysis, we needed hourly heating load data for a home simulated in the 99 cities in the United States. So we use a residential prototype building model from Pacific Northwest National Labs. We simulated both the 2016 and 2018 construction year models. The reason for this is just to look at how the results change depending on the construction properties of the building. The table here shows the main differences between the models. You can see from the 2006 to the 2018 construction years, there's a significant increase in insulation in the building. There is a significant reduction in the effective leakage area and infiltration in the building, and there is an improvement um, in the properties of the windows. Um, so newer construction, the newer construction model has a reduction um, in heating required. So switching gears to the mechanical systems modeled. Since this is a forward-looking study, we selected a high efficiency gas furnace option um, which was a condensing furnace with a 96% annual fuel utilization efficiency, or AFUE. For simplicity, we size the furnace at 100 kBTU per hour and ensure the heating hours are less, uh, and ensure that unmet heating hours are less than 25 hours a year in every climate simulated. In some cases, that's slightly oversized, but the results of the analysis are the same regardless since the efficiency of the system for a gas furnace is not affected by the capacity. We also include, as I mentioned, an analysis of the fan energy use associated with the heating mode only. <clears throat> uh, I should mention the simulation also has air conditioning, but we did not analyze the air conditioning impacts. So for comparison, we simulate a variable speed heat pump shown here. The data was based on manufacturer extended data tables for a train variable speed heat pump that has the ability to run the heat pump down to an outdoor air temperature of negative 18 degrees Celsius. The blue lines show the efficiency of the heat pump in terms of coefficient of performance or COP for both minimum and maximum speeds. The orange lines show the capacity ratio of the heat pump for both minimum and maximum speeds. The capacity of the heat pump at any outdoor air temperature is the capacity at the rating condition, which is eight degrees Celsius, multiplied by the capacity ratio at that outdoor air temperature. The heat pump can run at any speed between the minimum and maximum speed required to meet the model load. When conditions allow, the heat pump runs at a lower speed to achieve a higher efficiency. For colder outdoor air temperatures, the COP starts to approach one, which is the efficiency of the electric resistance backup heat. When the heat pump at maximum speed cannot meet the load, the electric resistance heat works in series with the heat pump. At negative 18 degrees Celsius, the heat pump switches off and the entire load is met by the electric resistance heat. The Energy Plus simulation auto sizes the heat pump capacity in every climate simulated at 1.4 times the design day cooling load, which is a typical sizing method for heat pumps. We experimented with different heat pump sizing methods, but found that increasing the heat pump size to meet larger heating loads generally provided minimal benefit. 
This is because on the coldest climates, on the coldest days, the outdoor air conditions are below the switchover temperature of negative 18 degrees Celsius, such that the electric resistance heat alone is required to meet the load. You can see here how the heat pump cooling capacity and electric resistance heating capacity were sized in the city simulated. The capacities of the systems in the 2018 home were approximately half that in the 2006 home due to the decrease in heating load. Here you can see the results of the simulation for the fraction of heat provided by the heat pump mode and the electric resistance mode in each region. The dark orange bar is the fraction of the heat pump provided by the heat pump mode. The remainder is provided by electric resistance heat. The hatched bar is the fraction of electricity for heating used by the heat pump mode. The remainder of the electricity used for heating was consumed by the electric resistance heat. The fraction of heating provided by heat pump mode was lowest in the coldest climates, the Midwest and the Northeast, where approximately 80% of the heating capacity was provided by the heat pump mode and 20% was provided by the electric resistance. The situation improves in warmer climates. And you can see here that even though the loads are significantly different between the 2006 and the 2018 home vintages, the percent of heating provided by the heat pump is similar because the heat pump capacity is auto sized to meet the design day load for each home. In order to determine the carbon dioxide emissions associated with end use electricity consumption, we use a recently released data set from NREL called Cadbium. In this data set, NREL published long range marginal emissions, which are an hourly forecast from 20 to 2050 for each state. The long range marginal emissions rate is the mixture of generation that would serve a persistent change in the electricity system and takes into account structural changes in the grid in response to demand. This is an appropriate model to use for heat pump ad adoption because it's expected that there will be a persistent change in load if adoption increases across the US. It's important to note that the long range emissions rate is significantly lower than the short run emissions rate, which WCEC used last year to run an analysis comparing heat pumps to gas furnaces. The short run marginal emissions rate calculates emissions for a change in load on the existing grid and does not allow the grid to expand to meet the permanent changes in demand. The NREL long range marginal emissions rates are based on their standard scenarios report, um, which I've cited here, uh, which for their mid case scenario is a conservative forecast for emissions based on state level legislation passed as of June 30th, 2020. The mid-case scenario does not consider any policy goals, including city, county, or municipal goals, unless they are legislated by the state. In our analysis, we applied the low-cost renewable scenario, which better reflects the existence of policies that encourage additional renewable growth beyond state-level legislation that's in place currently. The low-level renewable scenario forecasts that renewables will provide approximately 70% of the electricity produced in the U.S. by 2050. The goal of this slide is to show you data from the uh, NREL data set to show how the long range marginal emissions vary by state. This shows the average long range emissions over a 15 year period shown here by state and grouped by region. The change in emissions does vary by hour of day and by time of year. And while that was considered in the analysis, that's not shown here. This chart is just to give you an idea of how average values vary by state and by region. So you can see here, for example, that the Pacific region and the Northeast have the lowest forecasted long range marginal emissions rates. The highest forecasted long range marginal emission rates are generally in the uh, Midwest and Southeast and some states in the Rocky Mountains.
Okay, uh, the other source of CO2 emissions is from direct combustion of natural gas, which is a very straightforward calculation. Um, it's the natural gas consumed by the furnace multiplied by an emissions rate for combustion obtained from the US Energy uh, Information Administration or EIA. Okay, so now moving from CO2 emissions to talk about emissions of other gases. One of the issues with heat pump adoption is the concern of adding additional refrigerant beyond what is being currently used for air conditioning. Like I said, our heat pump sizing analysis um, uh, resulted in us sizing the heat pump based on air conditioner uh, cooling demand. So we assume that there's no additional refrigerant needed for using that piece of equipment as a heat pump instead of solely as an air conditioner. However, there are areas in the US where there are homes without air conditioning. And so if we add a heat pump to those homes, we've increased the refrigerant in use. In order to estimate the fraction of homes without air conditioning in regions of the US over time, we forecast the expected air conditioner adoption in the United States by region based on the most recent data published by the EIA in 2015. You can see that we forecast the lowest air conditioning penetration in the Pacific region, which includes coastal climates. In our analysis, we only account for refrigerant leaks that occur in the fraction of homes that would not have otherwise had air conditioning at the time the heat pump is installed. In order to account for refrigerant leaks in heat pumps, we have to assume a refrigerant leak rate. First, we assume the refrigerant amount contained in a heat pump is 0.256 kilograms per kilowatt of cooling capacity. We assume that the heat pump function does not increase the refrigerant charge, as I previously described. We use data from the US EPA to estimate the annual refrigerant emissions. Refrigerant emission rates are estimated based on some lost refrigerant at the time of installation during the operation of the system, and then some loss of refrigerant at end of life and removal and disposal. We've taken all that into account and calculated an average loss rate per year, which we assume is 7.5% per year for a heat pump installed in 2020. However, we assume that the annual leak rate amount decreases slightly for heat pumps installed in future years uh, using this function that I show here. Uh, we make that assumption uh, due to expectations and improved manufacturing installation and operating practices. As I mentioned, we assume that R410A is installed until um, is used for installations until 2025 and that R32 is used 2026 and later. Okay, switching gears to talk about methane emissions. To estimate production stage methane emissions, we used a study published last month by Georgia Tech that estimates methane emissions for each state as a percentage of end use gas consumption. Uh, the reason that we look on this at this on a state level is that there are several production basins for natural gas across the nation and their leak rates vary significantly. You can see leak rates are estimated to be the highest in the southwest and lowest in the northeast and the southeast. For gas furnaces, we also apply data from a CEC study that estimates half a percent of methane emissions are lost behind the meter in the home's distribution system. It's important to note that behind the meter leaks may still remain with the heat pump installation if other natural gas appliances remain in the home. We did not include lo losses associated with transmission and distribution because we expected those pipelines will have to remain pressurized regardless of the amount of natural gas used. The exception to this might be entire neighborhoods that are built without natural gas infrastructure or are completely electrified and natural gas infrastructure is removed. Overall, transmission and local distribution leaks are generally estimated to be significantly lower than production emissions. So we do account for the most significant emissions here. As I mentioned, we applied the emissions from production to both natural gas used in the furnace and any natural gas used for electricity production. In order to estimate the natural gas used for power plants, we pull the cadmium data, which forecasts a fraction of electricity generated 
by three natural gas power plant types for each hour. Then we applied average efficiencies to each type. This allows us to estimate the methane emissions for natural gas production leaks um, for each type. Um, the, uh, I've shown the modeled efficiency that we assume here for each different power plant types. Note that natural gas power plants only generate a fraction of the electricity forecasted to be used from 2020 to 2050 and uh, natural gas power generation decreases over time in the NREL model as more renewables come onto the grid. Okay, now what everyone's been waiting for, we arrive at the results. Um, the plot on the left is the 2006 home vintage and the plot on the right is the 2018 home vintage. The results for the gas furnace labeled GF are on the left of each plot and the results on the right labeled heat pump or uh, the results on the right uh, for the heat pump are labeled HP. I show three years. This is the year of installation. Uh, so 2022, 2028 and 2036. And the total GWP impact for the system operated for 15 years. The black bar here is the carbon dioxide associated with the electricity for the air handler fan. The dark orange bar is carbon dioxide for natural gas combustion. The light orange bar is the global warming potential associated with the methane production leakage. And the peach bar here is the global warming potential associated with methane leakage uh, behind the meter in the home with the furnace. Um, what's striking is that the 20 year global warming potential associated with methane leakage is nearly as significant as the carbon dioxide created by combustion. For the heat pump, we have again the carbon dioxide generated for electricity used to power the air handler fan. Note that the supply temperature delivered by a heat pump is lower, and so the fan electricity and associated emissions are slightly greater than in the heat pump model. I mean, than in the gas furnace model. Excuse me. The dark blue bar shows the carbon dioxide emissions associated with electricity for the heat pump compressor. The light blue bar shows the carbon dioxide emissions associated with the electricity for the electric resistance heat. And the very light blue bar here shows the global warming potential associated with refrigerant leakage. And again, the light orange bar is the global warming potential associated with methane production, which in case of the heat pump is used to power natural gas power plants that generate a fraction of the end use electricity. Uh, and then you can see here that um, uh, the exact same chart for 2018, if just, I wanted everyone to note the scale here on the y axis. So you can see that the overall magnitude of the emissions are reduced by over a factor of two for the 2018 home compared to the 2006 home. Um, but what's striking is that the trends um, in terms of reductions are remarkably similar um, regardless of the construction year. On the next slide, you see the same analysis, but for the 100-year global warming potential. When you look at the 100-year versus the 20-year timescale, the biggest takeaway is that the methane emissions um, have a more significant impact compared to carbon dioxide on the 20-year timescale and are less significant on a 100-year timescale. Um, otherwise, the, the trends, again, are, are quite similar. Here I show the GWP20 emission reduction percentage by region for total heat pump emissions compared to gas furnace emissions. As you would expect, emission reductions increase over time um, in uh, increasing year of installation. So you can see each green shade corresponds to a future year of installation. The average population weighted result for the United States and is an emission reduction of 60 to 70% um, across the US. The emission reductions are lowest in the Midwest and highest in the Pacific. 
the same trends hold for the 2006 and 2018 construction years. If we look at this on a GWP 100 time scale, where the impact of methane and refrigerant is less influential, you can see that the overall emission reductions are generally reduced slightly to an average of 50 to 60% across the US. And again, our lowest in the Midwest and highest in the Pacific. And finally, if we neglect methane and refrigerant emissions completely, and we only look at the CO2 emission reduction, we see an overall CO2 reduction in the range of 40 to 50% across the US. Um, again, same trends hold that emission reductions are lowest in the Midwest and highest in the Pacific. So in summary, our analysis shows that significant emission reductions are forecasted in all regions. Um, they're greatest on the GWP 100, excuse me, they're greatest on the GWP 20 timescale. There are a few limitations to the analysis and the results that I presented. As I mentioned, we simulated 99 cities and presented regional averages that are population weighted. It's important to note that the regional averages may not apply to smaller cities with the coldest climates. Um, it's our goal to make full data tables um, available on our website at a later date. Um, so please subscribe to our newsletter uh, if you would like to uh, receive updates. Um, also very important to note that the results shown here are highly sensitive to the forecasted emissions for end use electricity generation. Um, as I discussed, we're using these um, long range marginal emission factors uh, provided by NREL. Um, as such, the results presented here today are significantly different than the results presented last fall by our team. The main difference in the model being a shift from short range emission forecast um, from, um, from a 2018 year to now long range forecasted marginal emissions that allow the grid to expand with renewables to meet um, future electrification demand. These long range national emissions forecasts did not exist until a few months ago. Um, I also wanna note that I mentioned we simulate heat pump controls uh, with a setback from 68 to 65 at night with a essentially a morning recovery of the heat pump that tends to rely on electric resistance heat at that time. Um, there is a potential future opportunity for improvements to heat pump controls to load shift heating to times when emissions on the electricity grid are lower. Um, as I discussed, uh, all, we included emissions for behind the meter leaks for the gas furnace. Um, however, some leaks downstream in the meter rate may remain if other natural gas appliances uh, are still in the home. Um, uh, biogas is not considered in the analysis beyond uh, what's included in the cadmium forecast for electricity that's produced with biogas. Um, the, our main reason for this is that uh, the, uh, the forecasted availability for biogas uh, for capturing methane um, and using it uh, in our natural gas distribution system is that the, the studies that I've looked at show that the potential of that um, is uh, not significant enough to meet all of our natural gas demands. And so we make the assumption that that is more likely to be used in the industrial sector um, and that electrification is more likely in the residential sector. Um, and also a very significant limitation is that we have not analyzed operational costs for these systems over their, over their lifetime, um, which will have a significant impact on um, market adoption of heat pumps. And that is everything I have. And so I am open to taking questions. Fantastic. Um, there are some questions that have appeared in the chat and the Q and A's and they're starting to come in. Um, we have plenty of time, so feel free to 
to add some questions in the chat or Q and A's and we'll get to those. Um, in the chat, the first one is from Matthew. Oh, actually Matthew, we got, we got solved there. Uh, Randall had a question and he was asking, shouldn't refrigeration leakage be included for gas heating to the extent that there is also a cooling system associated with the heating system? Uh, so we only considered, so we, we, we don't consider any refrigeration, any refrigerant lost as a result of air conditioning systems, since this is essentially a heating analysis. So for a home that already has air conditioning and a gas furnace, you're going to lose some refrigerant and that's going to have a global warming impact. If you install a heat pump in that same home and the amount of refrigerant is the same, then, then uh, it's essentially a wash. So we only look at refrigerant emissions for homes that don't have existing air conditioning. Um, so they have, so there are, there is a fraction of homes out there, mostly in coastal regions that only have uh, heating and have no air conditioning, or perhaps they use non-refrigerant based air conditioning, such as evaporative cooling. Great. Um, the next question was from Eric and um... It was definitely at a certain point in your presentation. So it basically, did you allow 1.4 times cool, cooling load size? The, cooling load uh, yeah, the, the, the heat pump system was sized at 1.4 times the design day cooling load. And then the electric resistance heating, um, the backup heat was sized on the um, design day uh, heating load. Um, and Eric then, also oh. asks, why does the electricity for the air handler fan increase so much? Um, there is because the, uh, the capacity of the heat pump um, is significantly lower than the capacity of the gas furnace and the supply deli air delivery temperatures are lower. Um, it's significant. This is like a factor of three um, or more when it, when it gets, uh, when temperatures drop. Um, so you have to have more fan run hours in order to achieve the same load. And that's all accounted for in the energy plus model. That's an interesting result. It's not terribly significant in the overall emissions, but um, it's, it's interesting to see that. Um, but it, it, we do expect it. Um, Siva asks, what is the assumption for the end of life refrigerant loss? Um, in case of a heat pump. I'd have to go back and exactly look at the references we used, but um, I, there's some evidence that in, in some cases, refrigerant isn't recovered. When a heat pump is removed, it's essentially like vented or lost to the atmosphere. And so the EPA essentially estimates overall for the whole population of residential air conditioning systems, what fraction of refrigerant is lost over the life. And so we essentially looked at that and then um, uh, looked at the entire loss of refrigerant over the lifetime and estimated a seven and a half percent annual loss. Um, refrigerant, refrigerant loss rates are, um, are, you know, there are lots of different sources on that and there's not that much data on residential systems. And so there are sort of differing analysis on what that is. I think what's interesting is when we look at our overall results that the refrigerant emissions um, don't really drive the results that we, we achieve. So a change of assumption there would not have a significantly different impact. Um, I'm, Akel asked about eGrid data. I'm not familiar with eGrid data. Superjeet, do you have any knowledge of that? Um, I think it's similar to the NREL data, um, but yeah, I'm not too familiar with either. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't have an answer on that at this at this moment. Um, so we could look into that further. Yeah. Um, Mattel asks, what about the sizing of heat pumps based on load? Um, as I explained, they were sized at 1.4 times the design day cooling load. And we, um, we, uh, we, we 
analyzed uh, different heat pump sizing factors and did not find a significant uh, change in the results. Um, and so we, we essentially settled on using that 1.4 factor. Um, you also mentioned that there is outdoor fan power associated with the heat pump uh, and that is included. It's included in the, in the compressor number. Um, I just, we just didn't disaggregate that. So just to clarify. Um, per your, Sharon says, per your results, it seems like there is not a big impact of doing a lot of research and then market transformation in low GWP refrigerants. Am I reading that correctly? N not exactly. Um, uh, the, there, we're only looking at the impact of electrifying, take, putting in that, taking out that gas furnace and putting in that heat pump or installing a heat pump instead of a gas furnace. If you would have installed an air conditioner, then you wouldn't have that refrigerant anyway. And so we're looking, so just because you use it as a heat pump doesn't increase emissions, but there are significant refrigerant emissions associated with air conditioning and those do have a global warming impact. We were just only in the analysis accounting for refrigerant emissions that, um, that are associated with adding heat pumps where air conditioning wouldn't already exist. Um, and then she says, if you could push the market to do one thing to lower our collective carbon footprint from HVAC and residential buildings, what would you do? I don't know. I'm not sure I'm prepared to answer that. I'm more of an engineer and less of a policy person. <laughs> Um, Johnny asks, is there an updated report with this new data and results? Uh, we're currently working on submitting a publication to the Energy Policy Journal. Uh, so what we'll do um, immediately is get this webinar um, up on our website. And then as um, new information is available, we'll, we'll continue to update it. Oh, Eric Wilson shines in eGrid is annual, not hourly. Uh, so we would not be able to run the detailed analysis that we have here. What's, what's special about this analysis that was we're actually looking at the time of day that heat pumps are running because, because often that's during times when, um, for example, like uh, PV resources, solar PV is not generating. Um, so I think it's really important to look at the, the hourly simulations. Joe says, for a given capacity, R32 systems require 15% less charge. Was this accounted for? Uh, no, that was not accounted for. Um, I don't, because the refrigerator emissions are so minimal compared to the other emissions, it, um, it wouldn't have a significant impact on the results, but thank you for sharing that. Um, the name of the NREL long-term planning tool we use is called Cambium. I have a really hard time saying it, but uh, the, the link is down here, um, number 10. They have a great online viewer um, where you can look at different scenarios and, and different states and different years. And then you can also download all the raw data as well. And Let's if you get all the chat else. questions, Teresa, then we're moving on to the Q&A. There's a, a number of questions in the Q&A panel as well. So don't okay. worry, we're getting to you. We're just kind of working through the chat and then <laughs> we'll work to the Q&As. Uh, have you included GHG emissions associated with manufacturing the furnace um, if, and the heat pumps as well as manufacturing the refrigerants? Um, no. So we only look at the operational emissions here. Certainly there are other embodied emissions that we have not accounted for. Um, Ian Walker asks, were emissions associated with heat pump operation in cooling mode only assessed for homes that would not have otherwise had cooling? So we're actually in the emissions here, these results, we're only showing the emissions associated with operating the heating. We're not including any emissions associated with operating the cooling. Um, that would also be an interesting analysis, but we, we have not, uh, we did not include that. And um, 
we, we don't have any plans currently to another question on embodied energy and embodied carbon. We don't have any um, um, plans in our scope to, to, to do that. Um, but if there are other parties out there, um, you know, we, like I said, we intend to publish all this and make it available. Um, so, but hopefully people can expand on our work. Um, okay. All right, so moving on to the Q&A questions. Um, Justin asks, what was the assumption behind carbon emissions counted from heat pump refrigerant leakage? So for heat pump refrigerant leakage, we, um, they're not carbon emissions, it's refrigerant emissions multiplied by the global warming potential for that particular refrigerant gas. So we assume a certain fraction of homes um, won't, wouldn't otherwise have air conditioning. When we add those fraction of homes have heat pumps added, we uh, figure out what the charge of that heat pump would be. And we assume a certain leak rate and we assume a certain VWP applied to that, that leaking refrigerant. Um, and that's how those emissions are accounted for and then compared to carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, Aaron Weiner asks, sorry if I missed this, were efficiency improvements over time for either gas or electric equipment integrated into the findings? Ah, uh, no, we only modeled the very specific equipment that I've shown here, 96% AFUE for the gas furnace. And this particular piece of uh, train equipment that uh, has the efficiency curve shown here. Um, no asks, will you be testing your assumptions? Um, I'm not, uh, I suppose the question is there, um, will we be validating this against field data? Um, we don't have any plans to do that. In the paper we're writing, we are trying to pull from as much other existing literature as possible to try and compare our results with what others um, have, have seen and observed and calculated. Um, Marshall Hunt asks the CO2 emissions charts by region in California is the Pacific region. Uh, so Marshall, you can see here, the Pacific region includes um, these four cities in California, uh, which is the sort of the South Central Valley, Los Angeles, San Jose and Sacramento, but also includes the Pacific Northwest, a couple cities in Oregon and Washington. Um, <clears throat> and we're happy to provide uh, data tables that show um, specific results for the specific cities. Um, Abigail asks, why was the analysis done with recently constructed homes only? Um, would the analysis likely differ with older homes? Um, so in order to do this analysis, we had to have a building model. And it's very difficult to decide, you know, when we're looking across the US, what should the building model be because home construction differs so significantly. And so our approach here was we selected the 2000s, we, we used basically, we, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel and we had limited, limited scope and limited funds. So we decided to use existing prototype building models from DOE. And so there we chose essentially the oldest home available, which was 2006 and the newest home available, which was 2018. And I think what's really interesting is when we look at the trends across those two homes, even though the magnitude of the savings is significantly different, the percentage savings is not. And so that, that, that gives us some clues that, that the, magn the percentage of savings may hold true um, on average, essentially, irregardless of year for a year of construction. Um, so we analyzed those two years, but yes, I mean, I, it's hard to know exactly what would happen in, in a particular home of a particular vintage. And, and that was essentially, we basically used what we had available. Um, another question on embodied energy and embodied carbon. Um, um, it, it's, a, it's a great idea for expansion of the study. We don't, we don't currently have funding to do that. Um, that agree that that's very interesting. 
Um, Bruce asks about comparing older vintage homes with and without efficiency improvements to essentially determine uh, whether or not um, what happens if you have improvements with or without energy efficiency, but what happens if you add a heat pump with or without energy efficiency measures? Um, would such an extension of the research be difficult? Um, I think that's, that's an interesting uh, proposal in terms of extension of scope. Um, it certainly would be possible to compare um, adding measures to certain homes and, and looking at electrification. Um, I think what's tricky about this work is that there's, uh, there's just an extensive number of simulations when you run across 99 cities and then when you run across uh, looking at forecasting out 25 years. Um, so there's just a large number of permutations and, and so we have to be a little bit selective in, in, in defining um, the scope and what we're looking at. Um, we've also, one of our goals is to put our, all of our, our methodology and models um, available on our website so that in theory people can take what we've done and, and run additional simulations. Jay says, I've seen a few analyses lately that use 20-year DWP. The HVAC manufacturers and many policy analysts seem to prefer 100-year DWP. Could you explain why different groups might prefer different time windows for DWP? Um, well, the impacts of methane leaks and refrigerant leaks are lower when you look at a 100-year time scale. Um, it's more dramatic when you look at a 20 year time scale. Uh, I'm not a climate scientist, so it's a little bit hard for me to answer the question as to, to there's just, there's a lot of debate on really how, how we should prioritize and how we should, should weigh the impact of different gases in the atmosphere and, and 20 year and 100 year time scales using this GWP method are, are one way to do that. And I've presented the results here for both of them so that um, so that um, people have the information. Um, but it's hard for me to say exactly um, uh, which we should prioritize. Um, okay. Bruce asks, is the EPA estimate seven and a half percent per year or is that your figure based on their data? Um, that is that is our figure um, based on our data. Um, based, sorry, that is our figure based on their data. And in the paper we're working on, we have a we have a short explanation as to how we how we get that number from their data. But it's basically taking the installation operation and decommissioning leaks and averaging it over 15 years. No asks. Why is the GWP on the gas furnace not transferring to the heat pump if you are looking at it from the source? I'm not sure. I don't quite understand that question. I'm going to keep going, maybe. Uh, We'll come back to that uh, if there's time. Um, Zudong asks, do you expect the emission factors to change for increased peak grid load in winter due to mass electrification or have you already accounted for that in the analysis? Um, NREL has accounted, the, the long range emission factors are hourly data um, for essentially the next uh, 30 years. And so that includes, um, um, the, vari the various uh, uh, expected demand on the grid. Um, I, it's interesting, I think what you're saying is if we add a bunch of heat pumps, will that change essentially because there will be more demand in the early morning hours? Um, and I guess I, I'm not certain how, how closely NREL has thought about that. There's, there's pretty good documentation associated with their 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 tools and, and their and their documents. So I think we'd have to look into that a little bit a little bit further. 
Uh, no asks, did the analysis look at end of life evacuation refrigerant? Yes, we included that in our, in our calculation a week rate. Uh, are there plans to run these models with vapor injection class inverter heat pump technology? Um, we don't have any existing scope to expand on this work. Um, we are a grant funded research institution. So if there are parties out there that want to investigate um, doing additional work on this with us, sure, feel free to contact me. Um, Akel says, future gas furnaces will be fueled with blended hydrogen. How will the analysis change if you were to include this aspect of your analysis? The gas grid will change in the next 20 years, just like the electric grid will change. Um, yeah, like, like I said, um, we assume in our analysis, um, as, a limit, as a limitation of our analysis, that uh, we assume that the methane, the natural gas produced is, is essentially extracted from the ground. Um, and so changes in those assumptions would change the results. Um, and so, uh, like I said, we, we use data sources that we had available to us. Uh, we can certainly consider others. Um, I think our thinking on the residential side is that it's the easiest to electrify, the heating loads are the easiest to electrify and that, that one expectation, you know, one potential future version of the world is that the gas structure is uh, prioritized essentially for industrial loads and some commercial loads. Um, but regardless, just being very transparent, right, that that was a limitation of our study and that we, um, we did not look at those scenarios. Um, Dennis says, some heat pumps can have two to three times the amount of charge you assume because they often utilize larger heat exchangers than minimum efficiency air conditioners. Uh, the choice to essentially not count any refrigerant leak impacts for any system that already has IC really undervalues direct emissions of heat pumps. Maybe you could scale the lifetime refrigerant leakage proportionally to the annual heating versus cooling energy of the system. Um, is the heat pump share of direct leakage? So, you know, on the issue of what refrigerant emissions to include, I mean, the issue is, is that if you install a gas furnace, it's highly unlikely that somebody is also going to get rid of their air conditioner. I think that air conditioner adoption rates in the U.S. are, are there's just rapid adoption um, and growth in the air conditioning industry. And so it's, it's kind of hard to imagine that it, even if somebody doesn't have a heat pump, they would not choose their air conditioner or not have one. Um, so... Anyway, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's debatable, I suppose. Um, we did some literature review on uh, the charge for the heat pump. I think I included um, uh, one source down here, um, but certainly if you have other, any other sources you think we should consider um, on heat pump charge, uh, please feel free to share. Um, the amount that we assume here was consistent with the heat pump that we modeled. Um, let's see, um, regarding embodied GHG emissions, both furnaces and heat pumps with current tech, the vast majority of the GHG impact is from energy consumption. If you include the refrigerant impacts for the heat pumps, as is done here, and even more clear than body energy isn't likely to be significant. Uh, this is from an EIO life cycle cost analysis. Um, thanks for the comment, Abigail. If you wouldn't mind forwarding on that source, I would be um, um, appreciated. Um, Kevin Duell says, how sensitive is the analysis to heating set points? Um, we actually played around with that a little bit. Um, I, it was less sensitive than I expected in terms of percentage savings. Um, but I think that's one of the most interesting, you know, potential sort of add-ons to the work is, is thinking about how heating set points could be changed or manipulated to minimize emissions. 
um, which will sort of always be changing as the grid grid develops. Um, so uh, we haven't looked at that extensively to answer your question, but the little bit of work we did do, um, uh, it wasn't as it, it wasn't terribly significant. It changed overall emissions, but again, not percentage reduction. So Teresa, it is 11. Um, and if you're willing, I think we have maybe five questions left. We can stay on. Um, but if you need to go and you're attending, we appreciate you uh, joining us today. Uh, we will send an email to all those that registered and participated in the webinar with a link to our YouTube video and the slides. Um, again, join our newsletter and we have Teresa's contact information if you'd like to follow up on data sets um, and, and um, additional projects. Uh, thank you so much for attending. And if you have time to stick around, I think if it's okay with Teresa, we'll have uh, maybe another five minutes for questions. Just the ones that have already been input into the um, system would be great. Um, okay, I'll keep going. Um, Joe asked about electricity transmission and substation insulating gas um, SF6, with, which has a very high global warming potential. Um, it's not included, however, uh, we did do a quick calculation on that. We looked at the global SF6 emissions and the, uh, uh, the global um, electricity use just to get at least a magnitude of SF6 emissions relative to electricity consumed. Um, and then we look at how much electricity a heat pump is using over its lifetime. And as you can see here, the GWP emissions are on the you know, tens of thousands. The SF6 impact in terms of global warming potential, you know, quick order of magnitude calculation was in the hundreds. And so, you know, compared to the 10 thousands. And so it, we, our, our quick math was that it was not terribly um, significant. And so we did not go down that road further. Um, Matthew asks, is there data to consider effects of shifting natural gas from end user under electrification to greater gas turbine generation in place of coal and effect of gas turbine inlet cooling effects during peak winter months when heat pump loads on the grid are the highest? Um, I'm not sure, again, um, we relied on the Cambium data set um, to run our analysis. And so they consider, you know, the, like I mentioned, those three um, natural gas power plant technologies as options in their analysis. Um, so we haven't done anything beyond that. And Ron asks, may we please see the 20 year GWP slide compared to the 100 year? Um, and we'll, again, we'll post these slides online for you to see. But again, here is the 20 year and here is the 100 year. And Teresa, there was a couple, maybe two or three more questions that popped up in the chat. So we head back there. Um, one of them has been answered, but the one starting with Ross. Um, chat, okay. Um, Ross, have you conducted analysis comparing gas heat pumps or residential combustion systems to electric heat pumps? No, but we have been asked um, a couple of times about uh, like a gas driven heat pump. And so um, it's a potential that, that we may get some funding to do that analysis. I think the next one from Matthew, you already answered. And then there's one um, below that. And I think that might be the last one. Uh, okay. Oh, um, let's see. Uh, this, this comment is, I was one of the developers of the PNNL residential prototype models. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the key differences between these models and older vintages would be the condition floor area. New homes tend to be larger um, and old homes tend to be leakier, and that would be potentially an interesting angle to explore. Um, I agree. We, although I don't show every result that we've done here, however, um, uh, we did run, we have run some analysis on looking at different leakage rates, looking at different square footages and floor areas. And the shocking thing to us is at the end, when we calculate the percent difference is that we pretty much end up in the same place. Um, I mean, things shift a little bit here and there, um, but, uh, but yeah, I agree. It's, it's sort of endless, the, the number of variables that we could look at. 
Fantastic. Well, Great. thank you so much for your presentation and thank you all for joining us. And we will follow up with a link to the, the video as well as the slides um, in the next day or so. And um, stay in touch and thanks again.